conversar sobre cidades, dados abertos e transparência. Né? E acho que é um, é um tema absolutamente relevante atualmente. Eu acho que é, eu tenho insistido muito em que é, dados abertos, é, obviamente, eles têm o seu papel relevante na transparência, mas o que eu tenho insistido é que dados abertos é uma maneira de você ganhar eficiência é, e não apenas uma, uma forma de aumentar a transparência. E o, o exemplo que eu sempre dou é o, a abertura dos dados do GPS dos ônibus que a gente fez em 2013. É, a gente abriu, esse, abriu esses dados, obviamente, as pessoas, teoricamente, poderiam controlar muito melhor o que está acontecendo com os ônibus, se eles estão cumprindo o que deveriam cumprir, se há alguma diferença no, no serviço que eles oferecem em, em, conforme a região da cidade, e assim por diante. Porém, o que aconteceu? Depois que a gente abriu esses dados, a primeira cidade da América Latina a abrir, eu sei que isso na Europa, nos Estados Unidos já é bem antigo, mas, na verdade, aqui ainda é bem novo, o, o Rio já tem uns, quase a metade dos ônibus com os GPS abertos, a gente abriu 100% dos ônibus, foi uma grande briga para conseguir abrir a, a, a interna, muito ajudada pelas manifestações de junho. É, mas, na, é, depois que a gente, a gente abriu, fez uma racatona para mostrar os dados, que é o comum quando se abre uma base desse porte. Em três meses, existiam 60 aplicativos indicando é, o horário que ia chegar o ônibus que você queria, enfim, usando esses dados para aumentar a, a, em muito o, o, a experiência do usuário. O que isso significa? A prefeitura não gastou nada com esses aplicativos. É, o usuário não gasta nada porque esses aplicativos têm um, um, um modelo de negócios que vive pelo fato de ter muitos usuários. É, ninguém gastou nada. Algum, os vencedores desses 60, porque a gente sabe que esse é um mercado que é, vão sobrar aí dois ou três, é, vão ter uma, uma, uma empresa... O, o, se espero que seja um brasileiro que acabe sendo estendo entre os vencedores. Então, quer dizer, você vai fomentar a atividade. Esse é um novo modelo de negócios que acho que é, vai ser o cerne desse debate aqui, essa mudança no modelo de negócio, porque a gente começou fazendo uma prévia entre nós é, do, do debate e, e me pareceu que esse será o cerne desse debate. Ou seja, é, o, qual é a importância, qual é a consequência de existir um mo novo modelo de negócios do tipo ganha-ganha, em que é possível você, interagindo com a sociedade privada, repassar serviços, é, permitir uma melhoria substantiva na qualidade dos serviços públicos, sem precisar recorrer ao, aos cofres públicos, ou, em alguns casos, usando muito menos recursos do que você usaria no modelo tradicional de inovação dentro do governo. Né? Então, vou chamar nossos participantes para não perder mais tempo. Então, a gente vai ter aqui Gustavo Maia, da Colab, Vem. É, que vai mostrar aí com um pouco soluções que, que o governo gasta uma fração é, do que ele gasta normalmente, com um serviço muito superior aos serviços convencionais é, de, de, de atendimento ao, ao, ao cidadão e, 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 e de é, fonte de reclamação, etc. É, vou chamar também, temos dois representantes da Transport Catapult, então o Alessandro Sarraceni é, e o Adam Ray. É, a, a Transport Catapult é, uma, é, um, é um modelo é, muito interessante que o Reino Unido adotou de como fazer inovação. É uma, é uma, uma forma de governança que a gente tem tentado copiar um pouco aqui, porque o que é, o que é bom deve ser copiado, é, que permite que, a, que, a, que os governos tenham condições de fazer inovação algo que é extremamente difícil é, de se fazer. 
é, no Brasil e, e acho que em muitas partes. O, o modelo usual de governança não permite que os, que os governos é, o, consigam ter o ritmo de inovação que o setor, porque a gente está observando no setor privado. Então, a gente tem que, para a gente conseguir isso, a gente precisa mudar esse modelo de governança. E a gente está tentando em São Paulo, com o MobLab, com outras iniciativas da São Paulo Aberta, é, que a gente pode conversar depois, mas o, o Catapult já conseguiu. Então, é, eles, os dois são da Catapult, mas eles não se conhecem. É, acabaram de se conhecer. É porque um fica em Milton Keynes, onde é a Catapult de Transportes, exatamente, e o, e o Adam fica no centro de Londres, né, na cara por mais de uh, 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 questões urbanas em geral. Ele, eu vou deixá-los falar sobre isso. É, aí nós temos o Kevin O'Malley, também do Reino Unido. O Reino Unido, não à toa, o Reino Unido tem sido é, vanguarda nessa área de dados abertos e de inovação voltada para o governo. Ele é muito interessante, ele, eles têm uma agência dentro de Bristol, é, aí voltada realmente para é, um, juntar toda a parte de dados abertos e tentar aí, é, é, fa fa fazer com que isso tenha alguma, alguma forma de é, não deixar que isso é, caia em, em desuso. E, finalmente, aqui, é, substituindo o Luiz Carlos Guedes, que está aqui, mas passou a bola para o seu é, colega, o Bernardo Einbinder, que também vem de... É, ele, o coordenador do projeto é, ProgeLab, né? Lab Rio, Lab Rio, que também é do governo, né? da Prefeitura do Rio, que é... O, 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 o Lab Rio, ele é, em certa maneira, o, o, a, a contraparte carioca é, do... Não exatamente do Mobilab, porque eles é mais amplo que o Mobilab, porque o Mobilab tem um foco em mobilidade. O Lab Rio também é uma outra tentativa do governo de, 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 de inovar com uma nova forma de governança. Então, isso está acontecendo em muitos lugares. O Reino Unido está mais adiante, mas aqui, pelo menos São Paulo e Rio, é, Recife tem algumas coisas também, é, mais ou menos. Mais ou menos. <risos> é, e, e a partir do Porto Digital, mas, o, enfim, vamos começar, então, a sessão. É, a gente vai fazer da seguinte maneira, eu vou, eu vou pedir desculpas, eu, depois disso eu vou, eu, vou, eu vou tocar em inglês, porque uh, acho que vai, ficar, vai fluir melhor, senão eles têm que ficar pondo e tirando coisa, então, e, e também quem está assistindo fica tirando e colocando, então... A gente toca em inglês, que acho que vai, vai, vai fluir mais rápido, porque a ideia é que seja bem dinâmica essa, essa mesa. Né? Então, a gente vai começar com cada um se apresentando é, rapidamente. É, eu, dei, eu fiz essa primeira apresentação, mas eles vão falar um pouco qual é o seu stake é, dentro dessa dessa questão tão relevante hoje em dia, de dados abertos, qual é o impacto de dados abertos para as cidades, e, e, e assim por diante. Então, por favor. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kevin O'Malley. I work at Bristol City Council, the local authority for Bristol. Um, I manage the uh, city innovation team. And as part of that, I'm responsible for our open data program. Uh, I've been working in open data since 2010, when a politician at the local authority stood up at a public event and made a very challenging statement, said, we only have two sorts of data in Bristol City Council, private data, which we're not allowed to release, and open data. And at that point, he was making uh, a, a battle cry, really, that we should be at the vanguard of a new movement to release data back into the, uh, the public realm where citizens could use it in order to build campaigns or uh, entrepreneurs could use that data in order to build businesses. Uh, of course, it's not as easy as it sounds within that statement, within that bold statement, and it's been quite a challenging uh, five years since that event but I feel as if Bristol is now making some headway toward 
uh, building a, a, an ecosystem of uh, developing data sets, releasing data, but also encouraging its reuse so that we can see value and we can grow ourselves uh, better, more beautiful cities in the future. Uh, so that's, that's where my perspective is around open data. Hi, my name is uh, Alessandro Sarashenian, and as Ciro said, I'm with the Transport Systems Catapult in Milton Keynes, next to London, because not a lot of people knows Milton Keynes, so that might be easier. Uh, and um, the mission of the Catapult, the Transport Systems Catapult, uh, is to uh, facilitate the debate uh, between all stakeholders in transport to foster innovation uh, in the short term and long term, and especially in the UK. Uh, I'm in particular with the uh, information exploitation business unit, and this is the reason why I'm here. It's the business unit that, uh, well, deals with data. And uh, what the business unit does, uh, we try to integrate different data sets, in particular from uh, infrastructure, customer, and operations, which is something that we don't necessarily have today. Uh, we try to find new ways to interrogate the data, uh, in particular new queries that we're not necessarily using nowadays, which is basically new questions that we may ask the data and the data can provide an answer. Uh, we're trying to improve these data sets, again, in particular in the, in the UK, but uh, more in general, any data sets out there that is available. Uh, we're trying to move towards a five-star data and for those of you who are not familiar with the with the term what we have today what transport for london uses for example or, uh, or the department for transport in the uk it's a, a three star rated data meaning that it's uh, available with an open license on the web that's the first star it's machine readable that's the second star and it's also machine readable uh, without a proprietary uh, file format that's the third star we're trying to move toward, uh, towards a fourth star so that the data is also uh, easily identifiable. Uh, it has a unique resource identifier so that you can point at it on the web. You know where to find it. And, uh, and eventually towards a fifth star, uh, which is also linked data. So the data is uh, open, available, readable, uh, in a known proprietor, proprietary format, uh, identifiable, and linked to other data sets so that different data sets can talk to each other, which is the base for eventually the Internet of Things. And we also facilitate the, um, the drafting of new standards, which again is something that we need, in particular uh, in the UK there is the Hypercut um, consortium at the moment, which is trying to push Hypercut as much as possible. Uh, and again, for those of you who are not familiar, Hypercut is a standard that allows different devices to talk to each other. And probably the most important thing that we do at the moment is uh, try to instigate the debate on why we should use uh, data and, uh, and provide new data-driven business models, which is really what we need at the moment, because a lot of businesses or a lot of things that we do uh, are never looked at from a data point of view, but seeing that we are actually trying to move towards, uh, again, an Internet of Things, we need a new business model in order to do that. Thank you. Um, so my name is Adam Ray, and I'm the head of data science at the Future Cities Catapult. So a, a, a brother organization to the Transport Systems Catapult. But rather than focusing on one particular technology or one particular um, uh, area of uh, um, uh, a, a domain like transport, for example, or precision medicine, renewable energy, we have the domain of cities and how we make urban places work better for ourselves now and in the future. How we make sure that the uh, the um, the systems in these cities work as well as possible uh, and that they work well for improving the quality of life of citizens as well. And so as I say, I'm the head of data science and my particular remit is on those projects which, which involve data and how we can use that to generate value for cities. And it's, it's a very rich and, and in, some, in some ways nascent area as well, which means there's wonderful opportunities to guide this um, uh, at the moment. So whether we're looking at being able to improve transparency in the operation of cities, whether we're looking at being able to improve the provision of services, public services um, uh, provided by cities, whether it's about fostering a more innovative uh, local economy through open data as well. These are all areas that we're looking at at the moment. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what the, the other um, participants here are going to be talking about today. But uh, I think that there is, um, having the presence of cities and those working in innovation as well um, around um, the, the panel, I think, is going to give a, a very rich conversation. 
move into the Brazilian side. All right. Pode falar em português? Eu acho que a maior parte da audiência acho que está em português. É, bom, eu, faço, eu sou coordenador de projetos do LabRio, que é o laboratório de participação da prefeitura, que não deixa de ser também um laboratório de inovação em governo, né, de como fazer as coisas dentro da máquina pública de maneiras diferentes. É, e falando de dados abertos, eu acho que quando a gente está tratando da realidade brasileira e mais especificamente de algumas cidades, é, eu diria da maioria das cidades, a gente está, acho que alguns passos atrás da, do cenário onde vocês já trabalham. É, quando vocês falam de, das oportunidades que vêm a partir da abertura de dados e de como vocês estão já articulando modelos de negócios a partir dessas informações, a gente aqui ainda está no, num, um passo atrás de falar qual, como a gente abre esses dados e, e mostrar o valor disso para os poderes públicos, para os governos locais, é, porque, apesar de todas as leis, leis federais, é, isso tudo é muito recente. Dentro da prefeitura é, do Rio, por exemplo, ainda é algo muito recente, ainda tem muitas críticas nos rankings, muitas cidades ainda é, não sabem como fazer, como fazer a abertura desses dados. Então, acho que a gente ainda tem que, é, tem que dar um, um passo para trás para a gente começar a, a discutir. E o que o Ciro começou a falar das oportunidades que vêm da, dos dados abertos, e aí puxando sardinha para o meu lado, né, do Lab Rio, é, essas oportunidades que surgem a partir das informações, a gente, na, na prefeitura, a gente vê como elas poderiam melhorar a, a qualidade de vida na cidade, como poderia melhorar o, o oferecimento de serviços públicos, mas também a, constru, a própria construção das políticas públicas é, nos governos locais. É, então, essa é a nossa, a nossa visão sobre os dados abertos, como a gente trata, né, porque hoje em dia muitos fala de smart cities, é, e pouco, pouca gente sabe definir direito o que é o smart cities. Então, na nossa visão, smart cities é quem consegue, nessa era de informação que a gente está vendo, onde há uma abundância de informações é, de todos os lados, sendo geradas a cada segundo, é, eu acho que os smart cities são os governos locais que melhor sabem utilizar essas informações para o bem da própria população que vive nela. Vou, vou em português também, depois, quando entrar o debate, eu acho que eu, eu tento em inglês. Uh, sou Gustavo Maia, eu sou empreendedor, um empreendedor social, sou fundador do Collab, que é uma rede social para a cidadania, esse é o slogan que a gente usa, mas, no fim das contas, o que a gente faz é conectar cidadão a governos, é o que a gente tenta fazer, pelo menos. A gente é um aplicativo, uma rede social, então tem um aplicativo, tem, enfim, tem o site, onde a pessoa publica problemas, ela fiscaliza problemas da cidade, então, pô, tem um buraco na rua, eu tiro uma foto, pego a localização na hora, eu vou lá, eu coloco a categoria e publico, uh, isso, isso fica aberto para todo mundo da cidade, eu posso também propor uma melhoria, então, eu posso propor um banco, um local para um banco para sentar, ou eu posso propor, enfim, uma série de categorias, ou eu posso avaliar serviços e espaços públicos. Quando eu faço isso, isso fica aberto para todo mundo da cidade, e aí eu conecto pelo outro lado a prefeitura, o governo, enfim, governos, principalmente prefeituras, para que respondam e façam um atendimento em cima disso. O Colab ganhou um prêmio de melhor aplicativo de cidade do mundo, foi eleito um dos cinco melhores aplicativos de governo e participação do mundo pela ONU esse ano, e a gente hoje, a primeira cidade a entrar no Colab oficialmente foi Curitiba, a prefeitura de Curitiba, em março do ano passado, e de lá para cá, em 16, 18 meses, são 80, 80 prefeituras no Brasil. Então, tem Curitiba, Porto Alegre, Teresina, Pelotas, Santos, Campinas, enfim, tem Natal, Brasília, tem um monte de cidade lá dentro. E aí o que a gente faz, por outro lado, também, é fazer um, um, um sistema muito forte de gestão de, da cidade. Então, a gente começou com um aplicativo muito voltado ao cidadão, e ele permanece, é gratuito para todo mundo, e a gente hoje trabalha com um sistema de gestão de cidade incrível por trás para melhorar a eficiência do governo e entrega desses serviços do dia a dia. É, Existem mais algumas coisas na plataforma que são do governo perguntar às pessoas e formar é, políticas públicas com base no que as pessoas querem. Quer fechar a Avenida Paulista no domingo para lazer? Pergunta a população, recebe a resposta, mapa de calor, gênero, idade, quem é acima de 50 anos da região. Enfim, você tem tudo quanto é informação ali. E aí... Uh, falando um pouco de dados abertos, assim, a gente, a gente como, como uma empresa, a gente uma startup, a gente tem limite de braço. A gente está trabalhando na API da gente já faz um tempo. Toda, todo, todo dado sobre a cidade ele é público, ele está aberto, todo mundo pode ver. A gente está trabalhando na API para que isso seja é, replicado e consiga ser lido melhor, né? Todas as informações do usuário, óbvio, são restritas e cabem ao usuário. Acho que é isso. Okay, now uh, 
let's try to make it a debate. So, and um, as I agree with you, I'll, I'll start with uh, some cash on coming out of my, my mind. Um, so, one interesting difference between uh, Lobby Hill and uh, Bristol and Catapult is that those are uh, local systems, although Rio is quite big, but it's uh, still at the local level, municipal level, while Catapult is uh, more than a country for the whole UK, right? So I don't know who of, of uh, anyone uh, could take this, Adam or Alexandro. Um, how do you think uh, is this the, the, the correct level at the go at the government, the correct level that to tackle these issues? Check that one. Is that one working? Yeah. Um, I think uh, cities is uh, a very useful level to try and have impact in. Because um, if you're trying to, for example, tackle big, difficult, thorny problems, um, say, around ep economic growth or looking at um, environmental issues and so on, those can be partially tackled at a national level. And if you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and, and looking at um, citizen projects where you're trying to tackle very local issues, there's only so much power and, and resource they have available to be able to try and tackle them. But if you go to the city level, um, you then have this sort of good mix, that balance between having enough power to do something important about it and being connected to the reality of the, the issues as well. Um, so I think uh, bodies which, fortunately, with, um, looking at cities as well, they're, they're very much looking to be able to network and connect with other cities, experiencing the same kinds of challenges, because that way you're taking um, successes at a city level and then be able to spread them around a national level as well. So for a body like, well, with bodies like ours, where we'll be able to coordinate both at, at, at you know, small-scale projects all the way up to national projects, you're able to have that flow of innovation going from different scales. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's one of the, the, I say the, the, the sweet points, I think, with, with cities, is that they, they have that balance of, of power and, and connection to the reality of the problem. Uh, I can add just sure. one thing. Oh, thank you. And, and the good thing about uh, also having the, uh, the national level is that, and I'm, I'm guessing that future cities, it's probably the same, we have um, kind of a, an, an overview of what universities in the country are doing, more or less everywhere. In particular, the Catapult has a, a university partnership program. Uh, it's a few million pounds. I can't remember the, the exact figure. But there are 11 universities in it uh, from all over the country, again. And uh, you do get fresh ideas independently of where you geographically look for them. So. This is great. Sure. Just, just to add. That, that I agree, I think cities is the right scale to be approaching these issues. Um, and I, I think many cities share the same problems to do with uh, air quality or traffic congestion, but the solutions can be radically different um, because Bristol isn't like Manchester and isn't like London in terms of the solutions that will work. Um, so to to get the correct solution, you must understand the characteristics of that city, and those characteristics might, might be geographic. Um, Br Bristol is a cycling city. It's a city where people like to cycle because it's, uh, it, it's set up that way. Um, and so one of the solutions to congestion is to improve cycle lanes. Um, but that doesn't work for every city because some cities just geographically don't work as cycling cities. So at that city scale, you can understand the characteristics of your environment and the people who live within that environment to come up with the right solution to shared problems. And I, I always, uh, just to add, um, I always joke that um, it, the, the, the word citizen comes from the word city, or it's related to the word city. So no one is a, is a state zen or a country zen. They are a citizen. So is in the city that the, the citizenship is fully experienced by the, by the locals, is where they go to work, where they live, where they hang out with their friends, where do they uh, go to leisure to, to watch uh, some movie or, or to have a, a beer with their friends. So I think the city level is, uh, it's, it's, uh, is a trend for us to um, treat all, all polit political issues in the city level. I think that's essential for us to think, even for sustainability, for instance, uh, it's easier for us to control when uh, decisions are decentralized and if we're always uh, doing like this uh, top-down uh, policy from the national level towards 
for instance, in, Rio, uh, in Brazil, that we have over uh, 5,000 municipalities. So I think it's always easier uh, and, and, and nicer to go from bottom up. That's great. Sure. Um, in Collab, what, what we do is that we, we're working with 80 municipalities. So um, when we, we see that uh, like a municipality cl uh, resolves solves some problem, quicker than another, we take these best, best practice, we, we take the mayor sometimes and we, we take them to another city and we are all, we're, we're trying to, to make these cities all share things and share best practice. So it's kind of, right. it's n not a view of only one city, but like being with 80. Okay, so uh, I think you're pretty much everybody on the same page here. So uh, the, the, the correct level to really foster innovation we believe uh, is at the local level. Uh, that's the citizen, as uh, Bernardo correctly said. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if it's, it's happening at the city level, we are missing some coordination. And uh, that's what Catapult is providing. Uh, so all the city is doing it independently, uh, like uh, we are doing something in Sao Paulo, and Rio is doing something else. So uh, we we communicate very little. Uh, probably, if we had something like catapult here, and uh, uh, and actually catapult, uh, we have a, a, a memorandum of understanding with catapult. They are not just uh, doing the coordination inside the UK, but also outside. So they are helping ourselves, for instance, and probably many more uh, cities around the world that I don't know. And uh, so we, the, the, the national level will have this important job of coordinating while the uh, things will actually happen at the city level. That's, that's very interesting. And I love uh, uh, what Gustavo just said because somehow uh, collab is doing a, a, a little bit of coordination by itself because uh, they are the private sector. Mm -hmm. So they don't need to respect any boundaries like ourselves. So the private sector itself can do some coordination. Of course, not general because they, they would do just with the municipalities that actually uh, are in the platform, but uh, it doesn't matter because they, they can do that. I will follow uh, the question of uh, players. So I start with uh, national versus local players. And now I'm moving to, to Gustavo directly because, and you can say whatever you, you would say about the previous issue. And uh, to, to discuss, and then I believe everybody will have something to say, uh, exactly this point of uh, how the private sector itself we will really cooperate uh, in this process of opening data. So Colab is uh, opening the data themselves, but uh, there are lots of opportunities, and uh, th then you, you can give a lot of examples, and, uh, and, and maybe Bernardo can give one, just one example, uh, a, a best practice, one best practice that he chooses it's important to share. And, um, and, and it, wh what, what are the, what is the private sector doing with open data? And although you have the other way around, so you, you collect the data and open it to the world, but uh, how, how is it working? How, how can you, you really contribute Again, in the, in, the, in the business model that I mentioned in my initial speech, uh, not charging the user. And uh, so for some cities charging, he didn't say, but if, if you're a city and you want to use their platform, they have a free version as well. And so how, how are you giving all these resources to people uh, we, we, without making... Uh, for free in, in, in most cases and, and, and then charging much less than usually costs. Um, what, what we're doing, we're, we're in the private sector and so we, we saw something, like what we saw is that there is a really 
huge valley between what people want, in, and mostly in Brazil, what people want and w what the government is providing, right? So we saw this and now we have to build this bridge. So, so let's start doing it. Let's, let's see what people, if we, if we open a platform, if people are going to use it and people started using it. And then we said, no, we have, to, you have, we have to give this to the government. We have to open this data so people can see everything and the government can join it. So that was the other step we took. And, and then when, when this starts happening, we, we, uh, when we, this started happening, we, we, we saw that we had, oh, we have to open now the data and provide this data to everybody so another companies can use it and improve it. So what we do in Collab, we, we create data. We, not actually, people create collaboratively uh, by publishing things. They create data and we give, we give to the market. And we, we're always trying to, to push government to open data so we can use it and we can make, maybe do something with it and make, make some money with it. And, and that's how the market works, I think. Do you want to share some uh, uh, interesting uses like uh, transport API or? I, I was actually going to make a, a, a comment on the uh, top-down, bottom-up approach okay. that Great. we were discussing right before, and I'll come back to this. You'll you'll see why. Uh, I, I do agree. Uh, innovation comes from. Um, from the city level, from the, the actual users, they, have, they live the city, so they may have an idea on how to make it better. Uh, and, and again, that's where you see a nice idea like yours uh, taking, taking place, for example. Uh, from a national point of view, though, uh, I believe that you, you do need um, regulation coming from, uh, fr from the top, from a high level. So basically what I'm trying to say here, coming back to the private sector, is that I think there is a misconception, we were discussing about this this morning, open data uh, is not necessarily free data. So what I was saying before about the uh, data-driven business models, uh, you can convince the private sector, and it's actually true, that they can uh, collect data in, uh, in an open way, so uh, with different stars, with, with a certain, uh, with, in a certain, using a certain standard, and, uh, and the government can do that, the regulation can do that. If you collect data, please collect it this way. You can still make money out of it, even though the data you collected, you collected it in, in an open way, so it's an open license. So it's, again, as I was saying before, machine readable, uh, non-proprietary format, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this way, we know that the data is there, it's being collected in the right way, it's usable in the future. We can actually do something with it, like with your app, still, nothing uh, forbids you from selling the data at some point, so you can make money out of it, or you don't, it, it depends. But again, it, it needs to be, uh, the, the use of data needs to be in your business model somehow. And uh, an example of the, uh, of the regulation coming from a higher level may be um, uh, a standard called uh, BIM, building, inf information, building Information Modeling, which is basically the way you make a digital uh, a, dig a digital representation of whatever it is that you're doing, whatever project you're doing. And, um, and again, as we were discussing this morning, by 2016, in the UK, all the public contracts are required to be BIM Level 2 certified. By 2019, they will have to be BIM Level 3, which is probably something that, uh, it, it's kind of a too, uh, too high of a target, but anyway, it'd be, it'd be great if, uh, if it happened the way it's supposed to. So the government is actually telling people uh, how to use the data, and then it's really up to them, and again, you can advise as the catapult or as the government or as the municipality, you can advise the private sector on uh, how to use it. You can't necessarily force them to put, it, put it, to put it out for free, but in the good way, in the open, readable way. Yes, uh, one of the words that came through the conversation earlier was, was about sustainable sustainability, and particularly the underlying um, value model that under, under sits open data. Um, because at a very pragmatic level, um, working with cities, they say, well, we, we, we want to do more about open data. We feel it's a good thing to do. We, we've seen some good examples elsewhere. You know, we want to do more of it. How do we do it? Um, and they say, oh, but by the way, we have no money to do that. Um, please, can somebody help us do it for free? Which obviously 
doesn't really work out that well. So an awful lot of what are the, the, the experiences that have been growing up around the world, cities around the world, where they've been succeeding with open data, help make those compelling examples of um, how it can work and what, the, what you need to have sitting underneath open data to make sure it's sustained. Because it's no good, for example, um, fostering local uh, private companies who are dependent on open data generated by their local authority if in two years' time down the line it disappears or it doesn't get updated or nobody owns it anymore in, in, in some way like that. So you have to have this, this um, very close relationship between those who are generating the data, whether they are public or private sector, academia, or anywhere else, and uh, those who are going to be dependent on it. And we, we found examples in, in a number of different cities, the primary users of much of urban open data are other parts of the same government itself. Another department somewhere is wanting to get the information from another department. And in fact, it's easier to publish it openly than it is to somehow uh, get it through the maze of uh, within the same organization. Uh, which is good. That's that's a one valuable use case where they've been able to the value of open data there has been shown um, and increasing the communication inside the organisation. But I say if we're talking about private organisations, they need to have that that um, solidity, a, a, a strong foundation to feel confident to build their own business models on top of this open data. Um, and it is certainly possible. It's very doable. Um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. So uh, yeah, I would like. Kevin and Bernardo to say about their relationship with the private sector. Uh, well, just just to reflect on your point, Adam, which I, th I thought was excellent, that, that you, you you basically hit upon something which I think is critical to get right if you are looking to develop what I think of as an open data ecosystem. It's, it's not about just releasing data and thinking, okay, I'm finished now, I can go away. We are now a transparent city council. We are creating opportunities for business. It is, it is about culture change within an organisation like a local municipality, who, who doesn't, which don't change very easily. Uh, we're very highly bureaucratic, very established organisations, and our job for the last few hundred years has been to protect and guard data, to hold on to it. And now we're being told, okay, get that out into the public, release it, tell the public things. And that's the last thing people within public authorities want to do. When, when I talk to people within my city council and say, hey, release that information about th the performance of your directorate, they say, no way. I'm not going to give, and this is a direct quote, I'm not going to give people a hammer to hit me with. Uh -huh. Because they, they, they worry that when we expose the, the way that we work, that people will criticize us for it. But I always point out that people criticize us anyway, whatever. So we give them the real information, then they can criticize us for the real problems we have. But also they can see the challenges that we have and they can assist us in developing solutions that will work for them. Um, and uh, it's the people of the city who pay for this information, who pay for this information to be gathered and collected, so really it's the least that we can do to release it back to them. But you're absolutely right, we, we need to give the confidence to the people who we're inviting to use this data that this data will be there in the future, it will be updated, and in order for us to be able to do that efficiently, we need a massive culture change within our organisation. People need to see this as the job not as an extra job. Re creating and releasing timely, accurate data is your job now as a civil servant. Great. Bernardo? Yeah, I, I agree 100% with Kevin. Um, I guess that we live in, in a status quo um, where information is power. And once the government has a lot of information, it, it, it where it thinks it holds its power uh, somehow. So it's, as, as you said, we have to change the, the whole cultural paradigm that uh, is, uh, is prevalent in the public sector. Um, we have to uh, see, uh, show them uh, the value of opening their information uh, and being vulnerable for uh, its vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerabilities. Um, government shouldn't be able to choose uh, which kind of information it opens because uh, sometimes it will be actually benefit who's in charge at that time. So we have to make um, transparency and open data uh, state policy, not a government policy, not who's in charge is, gonna, is going to decide uh, whichever data is going to be open to the public. Uh, it must be a public um, policy um, as a whole, like uh, for the next uh, 
I, I don't know, for the next 100 years, they should, should be able to have a plan of how to open the, the, this bunch of information that uh, the, the government holds in their archi archives or their uh, hard drives. Um, so, because we, we have to actually end this um, technocracy that we live in, uh, where um, public, officials, public officials think they know better um, how to solve uh, problems in the city or how to, what are, what are the best public policies to be implemented. Uh, I guess we have to start listening to the citizens, which are the people who actually use these public services, uh, who live in the streets, who walk uh, through, the, through the streets and see where the holes are at and, and so on and so on. So citizen, uh, the citizen shouldn't be a passive agent in the city. It should be an active uh, agent. So we should start listening to them. And I don't think, I don't think we are right now uh, in general, actually, at least uh, here in Brazil. Um, so this is the, the main uh, change I think we, we must do. We change the, the paradigm of how, public, uh, how the government see um, the citizens and, their, their, how, how that, and how they see that the city is actually a uh, collab collaborative and collective uh, project not um, decisions that are made in, on the top of the tower of government. Uh, it should be able to, uh, it should be um, done in open spaces, whether it's uh, physic or physical or, or di digital, uh, but it should be um, decisions made with everyone. That's great. Can I, can I? Just one thing, I agree 100%. I, I, I'd like to to invite him to work in collab because that's exactly what we think. That's exactly what we're trying to do. I already heard of a lot of mayors or people in the public sector and when they see collab, they say, oh, I'm not gonna give this hammer for, for people to, to, to put in my head. But yeah, actually the problem is not the picture of the, the hole in the streets. The problem is the, the hole in the street. So it, it's actually better if you know that there's a hole in the street and you go there and fix it. So I, I, I don't know about this, this why they, they try to, like, to, to put the, the, the data for themselves. Just one thing. Um, first of all, uh, what you just said, that, that the, the problem is the hole in the street. I agree with you, and the, the data that you release can be used against you, but we shouldn't forget, and this is part of the paradigm change that we may try to use to convince the, the, the government or a public body to release uh, information. You can also use that information to actually praise yourself when you do something right. Or, uh, or if, you, if you don't, you can use that information to take corrective actions to make your organization better. So in a way, it gives you a, a better overview of not only what you're doing, but how you're doing it. And uh, I, I slightly disagree with what you just said. Uh, I, I do believe that we should listen to the citizens more and, uh, and, and uh, implement actions on a more collaborative way, which is what your app is doing and I think is great. But uh, don't forget, and uh, I, I do get this a lot uh, whenever you, uh, you talk to any, uh, to any officials, public officials. As Kevin was saying before, public officials uh, have kept data for the last 150 years, but also for a reason. There are privacy and safety issues with releasing everything out in the open. So uh, I do agree with you, a collaborative space is, uh, is fantastic and that's what we should use, especially to foster innovation in cities. So the, what, what do the citizens think that we should do in the city, in their city? Question to be asked, absolutely. Releasing the entire data sets that the government or the municipality has on somebody, it can be dangerous, uh, it can affect people's life, uh, it should probably be up to the end user, the final private individual, to decide what kind of information about him or herself we are releasing. But not necessarily everything just like that. We do need some rules, and rules have been in place for a long time. Again, uh, we, all, we always tend to think that, oh, well, the public official is a, is a bad person, he's trying to keep information from me. In a way, yes, but in another way, he's also defending me. See? Yeah, we, I think we're on the same page. And actually, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the, the huge debate about this aspect here in Brazil was about uh, publicizing the wages, the, the salaries of uh, public officials. And that was a huge debate when the, the transparency law passed on Congress.
So I, I, I think we have to move on. Yeah, <laughs> I like believe that one of the few countries that start, does that nowadays is Sweden. And uh, they tried to do the same thing in France not so long ago. It did not work, obviously. It did work here, though. Uh, we do have uh, the, the, the wages of uh, public servants on the web, but uh, and nothing happened. But uh, I, I, I'll, I'll take this and uh, uh, and and use the, the, the last. I will, I will start with uh, Bernardo. Be uh, very good for the society. Uh, th this this new uh, model because then uh, we we can really uh, we we are we are always uh, uh, talking a lot about uh, opening data in, in regarding accountability but I I I I I want to push a little bit more uh, on the on the side of uh, uh, not just accountability but efficiency as well I think this is a very important point. But now, uh, taking the last point, uh, you, 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 you can yeah. make your statement yes. and, 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 uh, and, and then I move to, to the next point. Yeah, I, well, I was going to say, I, I feel we've, we've got too much agreement going around in the panel here. So I thought I shall interject something that, that may go against perhaps the, the underlying spirit, Some, just a little bit. But um, not all open data is useful or valuable. Um, and we should recognize that there is a great diversity, everything from, say, that one um, spreadsheet that brought down a government due to corruption, all the way to a sense of reading about a temperature in some random neighborhood in some outskirts of suburbs somewhere that nobody ever looks at. And when we talk about open data at the moment, we tend to put all of that data, all that all together um, and don't recognize that, as you say, it's great, there's so much more of it. That when you've got all of this information out there, when you have that sort of distribution curve where only some of it is going to be incredibly valuable, and most of it is going to be probably not all that valuable, yeah. how do you help people decide what is going to be that valuable stuff? How do you allow them to prioritize, invest the resources in maintaining the most important stuff, and maybe, maybe deciding to let go some of the less important stuff, if that means it's more sustainable? So I think it's just uh, my... my so not, probably not all that controversial point, was that uh, not all open, uh, open data in, in and of itself shouldn't be the main goal. It's getting the right open data and in the hands, as you were saying, into the, the hands of the right people as well. That's great. So uh, now moving Sorry, a little bit. I, just finish, just <laughs> because then we <laughs> don't finish <laughs> anything. <laughs> okay. uh, I I, I'm, I'm just going to agree again so that we, we all, we're all friends once more. But <laughs> yeah, transparency isn't just releasing a four million cell spreadsheet and saying, okay, now you know, because you don't know. What you've got is, is, is something that's very, very difficult to interpret unless you are a mathematically skilled person. The transparency bit is about giving people the skills to do the data analytics, to understand what that is telling them, and to be able to visualize it and share it amongst people where it, it has some intelligence. Um, so that's often the bit that's missing. The data can be out there and the data may be valuable or it may be um, fairly useless, but having the skills to be able to interpret that data and see what it means is really where we've got to take people. Okay, so uh, I'll try to pull in minds because it's been boring already. Everybody agrees with everybody. So uh, 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 <laughs> I would say, <laughs> okay. Great, Gustavo will, will be the disagreement point here. Uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, I, I'll bring something maybe more polemic. And, uh, but what I'm, I'm, I'm getting here is that, uh, of course, uh, this, uh, there, there is now a, a, a piece of computer science that's dedicated to both big data and big noise. So big noise is getting aw away from the, uh, from the data that is useless. It's difficult because you're talking about big amount of data and big data is trying to make it uh, available for the citizens. So uh, the way you can visualize this data for, for the lay person to visualize this data is this technique of um, big data. So that's where there is some business opportunities and we, we are fostering those business to do the big data so everybody or the big noise thing and, and analysis the analytics and give it to, to, to the citizens. So I think that's more or less where it's working. But one important point that uh, was not giving so much attention that Alexander points out is, uh, is about privacy. So uh, I, I used to say that if you are serious about open data, you should be 
double serious about privacy because it's I uh, I agree um, also to put some uh, pepper on that uh, that privacy is very very important uh, you have to respect people's privacy so how can you have a, a general policy of opening data and at the same time guarantee that you have privacy. I'll give you one example from my uh, perspective. We don't know how to open the data on our smart cards, the, the, the transport smart cards. Why? Because I, uh, I don't want to release uh, each person trips. Uh, I think this I, I don't have this right. I, I, I don't care if it will be dangerous or not. Uh, and I do agree that you have to release uh, public servants wages because uh, who is paying for those wages are, are everybody, the citizens, so they should know how much they're paying for each one. And uh, so that's to see if I can find some polemic, starting with Gustav that want to disagree with something else. <laughs> I, I wanted to, to disagree with you, saying that everybody agrees. So that, that's all, I don't, I don't want to disagree with this. <laughs> Uh, I, I think you have to respect the policy, of of course. We, um, what we I, I was talking earlier today about about what we do in Collab is we are opening the data of the city, not of the citizen. The citizen has to be closed. That's all. That's my perspective. I I think perhaps we have to go a little bit further than just privacy. This this is open data, and open data shouldn't be personal data. It, it, um, but often if you, if you link one piece of open data to another piece of open data, you can interpret something which is personal to an individual. So we have to be very careful about that sort of linking of, of open data packages. But I think it goes further and beyond that to, um, to matters of security. How, how, do we, how do we maintain the data in, in a way that it can't be interfered with? Uh, but further into ethics as well, because what, what we're doing now is we're creating a, a, a tool or a resource with this data that incredible things could happen with and uh, how far do we give it uh, some consideration as to what might happen, what might this be used for, would this be an ethical or a good or a positive thing to, to happen. Certainly within the city council where I work there's, um, there's a real concern about uh, uh, that w that we should have some sort of ethical oversight about how data is used within the, within the city. Uh, f uh, just as a f for example, uh, technically it would be entirely possible to um, to tag every person within Bristol, my city, who has dementia, and we could know precisely where they were at all times of the day, and that we could, therefore we could ensure their well-being. But is that the right thing to do? Is that ethical? Is that, and, and it needs somebody with a bigger mind than mine to consider these things and to come back with the right answers. So I think we, we're moving into a new space. We're, we're kind of through the looking glass, if you like. And we have to start to think about what can happen with these enormous and amazing resources of data. And might we be pushing into a space where we can't come back from? I think that uh, usually, again, when we when we say the word open data, uh, we all feel touched a little bit by it because, well, they be they might be collecting information about me. Uh, from a merely transport point of view, even though I know that this is not a panel about transport, but just to give you an, an example, it should also be remembered that many things can already be done today without collecting necessarily personal data. Uh, I can put a sensor on a bridge to know how many cars go over it. Uh, the same sensor can tell me the uh, movement of the bridge, uh, the temperature of the concrete, uh, the, the, the health of the bridge as well, so that the uh, infrastructure operator uh, can actually uh, go there and act in time before anything happens, before we close it down, so that there is no disruption in the highways. I can count how many people enter a bus without necessarily knowing their names. Uh, 
uh, I can know if the bus is full, uh, what kind of routes, uh, the stops that are more full than others. Uh, I can skip a stop, for example. There are many apps uh, that are being developed. One uh, was actually uh, in the shortlist for the, the, Cop the Copernicus uh, master's competition uh, that you know, I, I was one of the judges on the panel on Friday. Uh, something else won, but the, the app can actually uh, allow a particular user to uh, pick a bus, any bus, and then tell the bus to skip some stops so that the, the, the route is actually faster and uh, that we already know that there's nobody at the next stop, so we, we, we can just take a different route. Uh, and the, the system works quite well. It's already been implemented in a city in Sweden. Uh, so again, uh, I do think that there are massive issues with safety and privacy. Uh, we should also remember that right now, in the short term, we can still do something, in particular for, for, from, uh, well, my background, in particular for mobility. We can uh, improve the mobility in a city and infrastructure in particular, smart infrastructure, allowing the change from a digital infrastructure, which is what we have today, to a smart infrastructure that it's connected to other da data sets, we can still do it today without necessarily uh, invading people's life. So on that, on that point to sort of personal data and uh, its relationship to open data and also its relationship to big data, these are different sort of classes of, of, of terms we're using and there are intersections between them but we should sort of recognize they're different things. But your point about how privacy is important, for example, well, I, I agree with you but I think the vast vast majority of people out there in the real world when barely think about privacy, particularly when they're interacting with, say, uh, online services. So the billion people on Facebook, they have a vast majority of them, I don't think, realize how much information, rich, valuable, interesting information that they are releasing to a private company that has very little obligation to really looking after. In fact, they're making money. They're profiting by you giving them this, this personal data. This is not necessarily open data, it's you know, personal data. Um, you know, uh, uh, was it, uh, Google services as well, being you know, tracking you around the web and so on as well. Very, very rich information they're generating about you, and it's very valuable to them because they can sell it on to other people, sell ads and so on. Um, we need to sort of think about, uh, when I think about personal data, and this I think connects with open data as well, there's this sort of uh, triangle between being able to give people transparency about what this data is going to be used for. So they know that I'm going to, if I give my data to you or you're going to aggregate, aggregate it up and give it to somebody else, I know why, uh, why uh, you've asked to do that. Another is to give them the, the control um, to be able to say, to opt in to these things uh, or to opt out of these things as well, perhaps more importantly, and to make sure that that mechanism is solid. But then also is uh, um, to be able to uh, make sure that there is some kind of reward or incentive for these people too. So if I'm going to give, um, whether it's give a private company my data because they give me a you know, search service on the internet or whether it's I'm giving it to my city because they can actually provide a better bus service for me, there is still that relationship um, between um, a citizen, a, a, a data generator and another body. And I think it's about making sure that we've got these mechanisms in place, not assume that, for example, because people are happy to give it to Facebook, they're also going to be happy to give it to a city. It's a different dynamic, there's a different relationship there. But are there lessons that we can learn from where that has worked well and, and uh, transparently that we can then adopt if we do want to support better uh, innovation on top of open data, specifically in cities? I don't, I don't know about UK, but uh, in Brazil, I'm sure that people don't care that uh, Facebook and Google uh, profit essentially from selling their private data, but if we, uh, the public sector touch one small piece of their data, they will be really upset. So, okay. and, uh, but uh, I think Bernardo wanted to say something. Yeah. Just, just one no, thing, it's, a, it's funny that you mentioned that. We were having this exact same conversation. This is a panel of people who agree, <laughs> really. <laughs> You, 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 bring you weren't even here disagree. this morning, and we had the oh, exact same disagrees. conversation with the exact same examples. <laughs> um, I think when we're uh, dealing about this sort of uh, priv privacy policies uh, within government, we have to pay very attention and be very responsible for it because when we are dealing with uh, government, we're, we are dealing with politics. So we are, we are dealing with elections, for instance. So we have a platform called uh, Agora, which is a public space for, uh, discuss, to discuss um, public policies in, in the Rio City Hall. Um, and we, we are very concerned about the, the terms of our uh, privacy policy because we want to assure that uh, everyone must be comfortable to register in the platform and use it uh, without uh, re receiving some emails, email marketing um, or being uh, added to a mailing list that 
he doesn't want to. So um, this is this is a very um, example uh, where government should be uh, and public officials should be very responsible when dealing with this sort of information. Like we 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 have a policy in lab that we don't send out emails uh, for anyone who didn't um, register actively to receive that kind of news. So if someone registered to our new newsletter, we won't send them anything that doesn't has to do with our uh, activities. And we, if someone registers in Mapiando, which is a, a crowdsourcing platform uh, to um, georeference uh, public services, for demands for public services, we won't send out uh, emails about Agora for them. So I don't think that uh, is very um, well put in terms of law in, in the government, and I think that it, it should. Um, it's, it's a very uh, strategic point that it should be um, dealt with. Yeah, again, uh, it, it's okay if you receive an uh, uh, obs obscene amount of uh, junk mail from private companies, but the government cannot do it. It's, that's, that's the way it works. But anyway, uh, since we have uh, basically no disagreement here, except Gustavo that thinks that we have disagreement here, uh, although he agrees, uh, uh, maybe uh, we, we can open to the public to see if someone uh, disagrees or agrees with us. Uh, I'd like to have the opinion of each one of you, if possible, really quickly, because we're running out, out of time, I think, is how can open, access, open data or information uh, benefit or, yeah, or change uh, mobility in the city in the short term, long, long term, for example, in the short term, rerouting buses in the long term, I don't know, I don't know autom autonomous cars being shared by everyone or something. Let, let's take three questions. Hi, I'm Judith Pollock from the Shell Foundation. Um, first off, I apologize because I know very little about data, so it might be a completely naive question, but I think we've largely been talking about data originated either from citizens like the, the pictures of the potholes or from publicly owned data. Um, what's the opportunity for data from private companies to be brought into the open data field because obviously there are there's a lot of data being gathered about us through credit cards through GPS through mobile telephones that could be incredibly useful particularly for something like mobility tracking how people move in a city what's the opportunity there and what do the cha what challenges do the panel see in terms of getting private companies to be part of the open data picture rather than keeping that data to, to retain the value from it uh, last question in this round Yeah, so to add in this question, um, I think that those are private services, but what about uh, how to uh, open data in the public service, like mobility, water infrastructure, in the cities, those are uh, privately bid, right? It's a public bid that private operators um, stand for it and they want to operate, but how to put open data in the concessions that are being held or they are going to be held? Uh, I think that Bernardo pointed out uh, that we have a huge step to make to open data. Maybe the international collaborators can say what they did. Okay. Um, we Just to Judith, before I pass to you, we, we are trying to put together uh, one agreement with Easy Taxi. That's a, a private company that runs... Uh, they, 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 it's an app that make the taxi works more or less like an Uber, and uh, and and uh, they we are trying to make a, a, a use their information, the GPS from the taxis to monitor the speed uh, on the streets. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one, and, and uh, it's it to be uh, the script will be open. So because Easy Taxi is currently in around a hundred cities, this will be one. Uh, way to explore the opportunity, but I will move around, so uh, otherwise I will be talking too much. Thanks. Um, 
I'm going to skip the first question because there are people who are much better qualified to answer that than I am. <laughs> and I, I'll move on to the, the, the next two questions and, and tackle them as, as one. Um, so as I understood stood it, the question was around um, how do we encourage the private sector to, to follow us, really? And, and, and I think that's often the job of a, of a local authority. Uh, certainly within the UK, we are the sort of the lead citizen, if you like, and it, it, it's down to us to, uh, to set the example. And certainly in Bristol, from, in my view, the City Council is uh, striving to, to show the way to, uh, to release data in a methodical fashion, to invest in data release. We're not doing it with, uh, with no uh, resources. We, we have invested. Um, and it, we're, we're working with our partners. Often those partners are still within that sort of government sphere, whether they be NHS, the, the health service in the UK, or whether they be um, the environment agency in the UK. We are working with them to, to help them to release data. Within the data platform I manage, I whole data for the environment agency for instance because they don't have the facility uh, they don't have the same facility as we do um, and, I, and I can imagine hopefully that as we become more and more successful and have a greater volume of data we will be able to draw in some of the uh, private sector enterprises that we work with to encourage them to release whatever data is perhaps not as, as commercially valuable to them um, the other part of the question was um, was to do with how how we can I, th I think how we can uh, ensure that data is is released uh, through contracts which we let um, in Bristol City Council. I, I've been really encouraged to see that at, at a very senior level. In fact, at the city director level, there was and this is only six months ago. There was a contract that was about to be let for a major um, software platform in the, in the city council for many millions of pounds which was pulled at the last minute because uh, there wasn't, uh, the provider wouldn't allow a clause to, uh, to say that this data would be open data. They refused to allow that, so the, the whole contract was scrapped, which, uh, as you can imagine, was a very expensive enterprise, but I think it shows that there's a genuine and real commitment to going forward to being able to release whatever data we gather and uh, hopefully giving the citizens and the entrepreneurs of Bristol the opportunity to gain additional value from that. I'm, I'm really glad that the three of you mentioned mobility because that, that, that's my cup of tea. <laughs> uh, anyway, how can uh, open data uh, improve mobility? Uh, again, whenever we think about mobility, we tend to think about the person moving from point A to point B. Uh, because, well, we're very user-centered, and it's normal. Uh, mobility, it's also about moving goods around and, uh, and ensuring that there is a flow of things. It can be users, it can be, again, people, uh, trucks, whatever it is. And the way open data can improve mobility, uh, there are several examples. For example, uh, one of the SMEs that we're engaging with is called Zipabout. Uh, you, you can check their website. What they did, they're trying to develop this app that uh, tells you, uh, based on a, a set of parameters that you as the user can choose, uh, which route to take and which public transport to use to go from point A to point B, uh, so that you can have uh, the cheapest uh, trip or the most pleasant trip based on a sentiment mapping uh, taken from uh, social media feeds to see how, uh, in fact, the trip is going to be pleasant or not. And on the other side, while routing the user somewhere, it's also uh, improving the efficiency of the rest of the network. So we know that if a certain amount of users are going a certain way, probably we can send trucks another way so that the, the, net the network doesn't get congested. This is a very basic example of how open data can improve mobility. And again, if you, if you can take the trucks away or the, or the train with the goods away from the same tracks with the train with the passengers, you're improving the, uh, the overall capacity and efficiency uh, of the network uh, itself. Uh, on the longer term, you mentioned um, a driverless uh, car. I believe that the, the, the key word here is a smart infrastructure, again. Uh, you cannot have a driverless car in the future, and by the future, I mean 20, 30 years, 
at, at, at best. <laughs> Uh, but you still need smart infrastructure, infrastructure that can talk to each other, it can, it, that can allow the infrastructure operator, whatever the infrastructure may be, a building, a bridge, a highway, uh, a tunnel, uh, the sewage system. Uh, you need data so that the operators can take corrective actions at the right time, which is not necessarily the case today. What we do today, we wait for the accident to happen, and then it's going to take uh, the uh, firemen a certain amount of time to get there. Uh, or if the bridge uh, breaks or the barrier breaks for some reason, we don't know. And so everything is delayed. And smart infrastructure allows the operator, first of all, to act probably from a remote point of view and to send people in if people are needed uh, in a shorter period of time. So that's the way it can improve mobility. Uh, to answer to your question about uh, private companies and, uh, and the way they release data, uh, I fully agree with what Kevin just said. It, it's, a, it's a local authority issue. What you can do, uh, you can convince these people and the infrastructure operator as well that their business model need to integrate the use or the release of data somehow because they're going to profit from it. For example, uh, a bridge operator may be willing to release data about how the bridge works so that a company like Zipabout can route users a certain way and the bridge is actually used in a more efficient way, the infrastructure will last longer, the maintenance cost will be lower. And people understand that, they integrated uh, data into their business model, the cost lowered, uh, the user is happy because it's getting a, a better trip, the infrastructure operator is happy because the maintenance cost is lower, Everybody's happy. We included data in the, in the business model. It was a good thing to do. Uh, a private example of uh, data release, uh, there's a company called um, Easy Parking. Uh, we don't have data about parking bays. The city of Westminster in London uh, gave a contract to a private company to install small uh, battery-powered sensors like that into the, dry the parking bays and uh, a small wireless antenna on lampposts so that the sensors will communicate. And uh, again, uh, it's a, it's a three-star data, uh, so it's, it's readable. Uh, the, what the, the city of Westminster said as a local authority, you can do this, you can make money out of it, but the data has to be open so that other apps can be developed in the future. And uh, basically, there is a, a, an economic compensation in order to do that. It's a way to convince uh, a private operator to release their data that can be used in other ways, maybe some ways that the private operator in, in the first place didn't think of. And uh, how you integrate that with the public data, to answer to the last question, uh, usually it's a partnership, uh, it's a, what we call um, uh, a PPP, a, a private-public partnership. Uh, there is a company in the UK called uh, FlexI, and uh, they, uh, they foster technology innovation, they're very well known, uh, and they, uh, on, on a contract with the government, they did several partnerships with other smaller private companies. And uh, one example that comes to mind, because you mentioned it, uh, because I was having this conversation yesterday with, something, uh, with someone from uh, WRI, is uh, water monitoring. Uh, so uh, Flexi uh, did a partnership with a company called Aquamatics. They installed sensors in sewage systems and uh, water tank and reservoirs in order to monitor the contamination, the temperature, uh, the, the, the states of the water in, in general. And uh, since it was a public contract, again, uh, the, the authority imposed on them to release the data in a certain way, in a structured way, so that it may not be available for free, but it will be available whenever someone needs it. And it's not necessarily open that it's available to everybody because n you don't want to release the state of the water to someone who might potentially contaminate the water a terrorist attack, for example, but the data is there and it's usable. And the, again, as I said before, the way to convince the public to, uh, to release it, as with a private case, it's, it's very similar, is through usually a public-private uh, partnership. Uh, there, is, uh, there has to be, as Adam said before, a kind of a reward because data has value, you need to pay for it somehow. 
Thank you. Um, actually, rather convenient segue as well, talking about smart and intelligent infrastructure, um, because this connects the business case around open data as well. Fortunately, the, the Future Cities Catapult is today launching a report on intelligent infrastructure, and particularly as examples where there can be shared experiences between the UK and Brazil. So if you were to go to, um, there's a URL, uh, tiny.cc slash Brazil report, um, you'll, you'll be able to download this report. It's in English at the moment, but it'll, it'll be in Brazilian Portuguese in a few days' time. Um, I have lots of cards with the URL on as well, so do just um, uh, catch one from me. But part of that is because of this, uh, this to ask this question about how do you convince a company that so far says, that data is valuable to me, it is an asset, um, uh, and why should I give that away to, to other people? And it's a case of by demonstrating, showing them those examples where by doing so, they, they get more back by doing it. And, it. and it can be difficult, and particularly if they are the first mover in their sector, in their area, um, uh, getting them to be brave to try it. Uh, it may, and in some cases, it may not always work well, but it's about giving it a go. And when they do have that success, is then sharing that round. Um, and particularly if we're talking about in the private sector where you want markets that, that function um, uh, smoothly, having uh, transparency in that market is key to have a well-functioning market. And sometimes that may well be a case of, of publishing, these are the prices I paid for my commodities last month. Uh, am, I, um, am I getting a better or worse deal than my competitors? Uh, that then can put pressure on the providers and other people operating that same market as well. So I, I think a lot of it does come down to being able to show, showcase um, those successes. Um, uh, it won't always be the answer in business. Um, uh, some people will say that all well, we should open all their data. That's, I don't think that's feasible. It doesn't make much sense. But there will be data that is valuable to release. Um, and it's about, as we were saying earlier, amongst all the, the, the increasing amount of information that businesses are generating, how do you choose which is the right data to release openly? Um, and, and how do you show to your uh, shareholders of your private company, to your citizens of your public sector, that, that, that you're doing the right thing? Um, I think uh, I'll try to answer uh, the, the first and the third um, uh, together. Você do Rio? So uh, within City Hall, we have a, a team called Pensa, which is the big data uh, team that works in, in City Hall. It's not very well known, uh, at least not for now, but it, it basically analyzes big uh, portions of data uh, generated by the public uh, or by the, the um, so public services or even uh, the, the companies that work with City Hall. So for instance, uh, they're monitoring um, the GPS of the bus because all 8,000 buses uh, already have GPS. So they are mon monitoring so it, uh, they can uh, see how many buses are out in the day, uh, in the afternoon and during the night. So this connects to your question because not only uh, they should um, put in the contract that they should open their data, uh, but they not only open the data, but open the data efficiently and with quality. Because uh, what Pensa saw is that only 20% uh, of the information generated by the GPS from the bus companies are, is reliable. Um, so we have to improve this reliability of the information, not only open uh, and, and make it available, but also uh, to um, make sure that it is uh, reliable. Um, so definitely, uh, that should be in the in the future contracts, and we also have in lab called uh, 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 a platform called Mapiando, which is about translated to mapping, um, where you can, as a citizen, uh, input uh, demands for public services, such as uh, where you you think it should uh, should have a bus stop or a uh, bike lane, and you can draw the bike lane, and all this information is gathered and consolidated by lab and sent out to the public officials that are responsible for this information. So now, uh, Rio is developing its first uh, urban mobility plan, um, and this information will be actually uh, used to subsidize the, the, the making of this plan. Um, so it's mapeando.rio.gov.br. Um, Still talking about PENSA, uh, uh, the, the second uh, an, uh, answer uh, about the private sector and its data, PENSA has made some uh, cooperations with OI, which is a telecommunication uh, a company here in Rio, which has 25% 25 per, 25 of the market, and with FGV, which is a university, uh, so they can analyze the flow of people in the New Year's Eve in Copacabana. So they can uh, map 
where the, those people came from and where they uh, got back to after the New Year's Eve so they can improve, for instance, uh, raise the, uh, the offering of some certain bus lines during the, the 31st of, of December uh, to improve this, uh, all of this. And they also made a, a cooperation with Waze, the, 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 the app. Um, so nowadays City Hall has access to um, all of a Waze uh, data, uh, I think, w within the, the municipality, uh, municipality borders. So they also, this is also another example of how private sector uh, data can be useful uh, to improve the quality of life in the city of Rio. I think this basically answered all of the questions. Yeah. No? So, okay, and then we, we I, I believe we have to finish. And uh, so I'll, 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 I'll let you talk and just we Since we're sharing uh, URLs, uh, if you're interested, since I honestly believe that the introduction of new business models, it's the key uh, to, to convince people in releasing data or not, depending. Uh, there is a, a new class now at the uh, CAS Business School in London, C-A-S-S. Uh, Professor Charles Baden Fuller. Uh, was at the conference that we organized on smart infrastructure a couple of months ago. And he now teaches exclusively data-driven business models and how to show companies and public bodies that in, uh, with including data uh, into your business model, you can get something out of it. And it's the reason why you should release it in the first place or not, and then you don't. But again, the, the modify that business model is probably the most important thing that it, we need to do uh, at the moment. And since you, uh, you advertised a little bit what you're doing, uh, if you go to uh, imdata.co.uk, uh, uh, you can see what five-star data looks like. It's, a, it's an index of all available intelligent mobility data sets being connected to each other. So we, we basically went from the four-star we know where the different data sets are to the fifth star. They're now all linked to each other. It's something that the Catapult published uh, not even a month ago. Uh, Andy Mason, a colleague of mine, was in charge of that. Have a look. OK. Uh, we don't have more time. I think we just, and uh, thank you very much for the panelists. Uh, I enjoyed a lot the panel. I hope you, you guys feel the same. <laughs> Espero que vocês tenham gostado da, da, do, do que aconteceu. Eu fiquei bem feliz em ouvir essas coisas, mas eu sou suspeito para falar. Obrigado aos panelistas, embarque. Tá.